As a young boy whose family owned a farm and worked on it, Henry was also expected to do some chores around the farm. But this is not where Henry's heart was set. He was more interested in doing mechanical things. However, Henry knew that his father would never release him to go and work in a mechanic shop. In fact, his father constantly told him that there was no future in machines whatsoever. At the age of 13, Henry tragically lost his mother. For the next three years, he continued to work on the farm, although his heart was far away in a mechanic shop, perhaps. At the age of 16, he suddenly decided that he could take it no longer. One night, he up and left. He ran away from his home, going all the way to Detroit, where he believed that he would find work in a mechanic's shop. Henry felt that he could never tell his father because his father would not understand and would not release him from the work on the farm, especially after losing his mother when they were short of one hand already. And so he was constrained by his father's beliefs to take this step. This little episode makes an important case in point for thousands of young people in our society today. Many, many young people are not aware of what their strength is, what they are good at. They have no idea about what their core competency is and therefore they end up deeply unhappy with their lives. A close friend of mine is an engineer by education, a musician by passion and by profession she's a language teacher. She did her engineering because she succumbed to the pressure of her parents. She learned music because she loved it, but at the end of the day when she needed money to meet her financial needs, she took up a job as a language lecturer. Now I know that she is not unique and that there are thousands of people all across our country who are engaged in a profession which they are not at all happy with, but they are there because they have succumbed to parental or peer pressure. Just like Henry Ford's father was trying to force him into being a farm hand and to work on the farm, many, many parents of young people try to compel them and constrain them because they want their children to follow the dream which they have nurtured in their hearts rather than let their children follow after the dream which is guiding them in their own hearts. Now, I think it's really very important to learn from this lesson of Henry Ford that it is critically important for each and every individual to find out what their true talent is. Where does their strength lie? And what is their core competence? It's only by discovering our core competence that we can find out the intrinsic value of our life. And after that, we can continue to live a life that is fulfilling because it would have fulfilled the purpose for which we have been created. Each person knows exactly how they have been wired. They know what they are good at and they know the exact thing which they love to do. So it's their responsibility to make it known to their parents and their elders that this is what they would like to do so that parents can invest in training them in that specific area so that they can become excellent at it and then make a real good contribution to society through that strength. So knowing what we are good at and pursuing that area of our life is really key to being happy in this world, just as it was for Henry Ford. He would not have had to run away from his home if he were able to convince his father that farming is not what was at his heart, but rather mechanics. So it's a two-way communication. Children have to be able to communicate what their strength is to their parents and parents need to have a year to understand what their children are trying to say to them. And then only can we live totally fulfilled and complete lives in this society. So if knowing our area of core competence is so important, you might be asking right now, how can I find out where my area of core competency lies? Well, are you the person whom families look to when they are wanting to organize a party or a wedding? Do they come to you to fix the venue, to arrange the caterers? Then possibly, 
you must be the one who should go for event management. Or are you the person whom all your cousins run to when they want to design a dress, when they want to buy some new clothes? Do they take your advice? Then maybe your strength lies in fashion designing. In a very general way, it is appropriate to say that where your passion intersects with the need that is felt in society or in your network, that area of intersection is probably where your core competence lies. Now, Henry Ford had a passion to make a vehicle that would move people and things from place to place. Living at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, there was a need for just such a vehicle at that time, where Henry Ford's passion intersected with the need of society at that moment, that was his core competence. And when these two intersected, it gave birth to the car. Hello viewers, I greet you all today and I want to tell you that I'm very excited about the lesson that we are about to get into because it's a powerful story of one man and a vision and together that this man and his vision could change the world forever and make it different from the way in which he had found it. Based on statistics gathered in 2010, this is the second largest car manufacturer in the United States the fifth largest in the world. This is a company that has produced over 5.5 million cars in 2008, has over 90 plants and facilities worldwide, employs over 213,000 people, and has had an income of 20.21 billion US dollars in 2011. It is a company that produces cars that have remained popular with the worldwide market for their durability and their dependability, earning topmost positions within different categories. Yes, dear viewers, today we are talking about the Ford Motor Company. So where did all this begin? Long ago, in a small village called Dearborn in the state of Michigan in the United States on the 30th of July in 1863, a baby was born. He was Henry Ford and he was going to grow up to be this person with an amazing willpower and a vision to change the world and to make the impossible possible. In time, Henry Ford developed into a visionary with a rare perseverance and he was propelled by a motivation that was founded in selfless service. These characteristics are a combination that are a surefire recipe for success. In fact, from a very early age, Henry Ford began to show the telltale signs of a unique gifting that he was to develop in later years. From his very young age, he had a fondness for mechanics and all things mechanical. Henry Ford grew up on a country farm. When he was a young lad, the railways and the telegraph had already been invented, but they hadn't seemed to impact life very much. This young boy seemed to show a great inclination towards things mechanical and evinced a strong interest in repairing watches. In fact, he became so good at fixing broken watches. A neighbor of his once quipped, every clock in the village shudders when it sees Henry coming its way. 
He was so good at repairing watches and clocks that he even invented his own tools and fashioned ways and means of fixing them on his own at the age of seven or seven and a half years of age. His father used to tell him that he should not do this for free because for Henry it was fun. He loved to do it and he never wanted to charge. But his practical father believed that Henry must be rewarded and take money for the repair work that he was doing. But quietly and secretly, without his father's knowledge, if somebody told him that they needed their watch fixed but couldn't afford it, Henry would do it with great pleasure. One time, his classmates in school were so jealous of the attention that Henry was receiving from repairing the watches of adults that they emptied a watch case of all its bits and pieces, scrambled all those bits together and handed it to him and said, OK, let's see if you can fix it. Henry was not afraid of this challenge and they thought he would never come back to him. But within 30 minutes, he came back with the watch completely fixed and working. Soon Henry's interest shifted to bigger and more complicated machines. One Sunday, when there were no workers around, he went to a sawmill and took that machine down to pieces. Very fortunately for his sake, he was able to put it together again before the evening was through. On another occasion, while traveling with his father on a wagon, they happened to cross a motor road vehicle, a steam locomotive. It caught Henry's interest and he jumped off the wagon to get a closer look. Now this was a life-changing moment in Henry's life because from this moment on he could think of nothing else but how he himself would be able to build just such a steam mechanism on his own and by himself. Henry's age at this time was 12 years. In his attic bedroom and purely based on the memory of what he had seen, Henry Ford now began to build a crude steam locomotive for himself, placing on an undercarriage the parts of the engine and connecting the wheels to the motor by a crude chain. This, in fact, was the first carriage without horses that was invented by Henry Ford. His age at the time, 12 and a half years. Coming back to the runaway Henry Ford in Detroit, he was able to find all the kinds of odd jobs that his heart cherished. He found work at a machinist, at a foundry and even cleaning watches in a jewellery shop. In fact, soon his skill was recognized by the owner, but the owner had to hide him away in a back room to repair watches because the owner did not want his customers to see a teenage boy handling their expensive watches. Very soon, Henry Ford's father discovered where he was and he came to fetch him. He tempted Henry by telling him that they had bought new threshing machines for the farm and perhaps if Henry came back home then he could help with the running and the maintenance of the threshing machines. It appears that he was able to convince Henry who went back with him to Dearborn and there he re-entered into his life on the farm, the social life at the church and the dances. At one such dance he met the pretty young daughter of another farmer, Clara Bryant, and he was smitten at first sight. Apparently, he prepared a very complicated watch that he gave as a gift to Clara and he won her heart. A few years later, they were married. Henry was 25 and Clara 21, and they soon settled onto their busy life on the farm. As soon as they had settled on their farm, Henry began to experiment with creating a farm locomotive and a steam road carriage. His mind constantly went back to an article that he had read in a magazine called The World of Science. The article had described an engine that was powered by a continual explosion of 
inflammable gas. Henry knew that the key to the machine that he wanted to invent lay in just such a mechanism. There would be a series of explosions coming from inflammable gas and this would generate power and this power would move the pistons up and down. The movement of the pistons up and down would in turn create energy and that energy would go in the movement of a conveyor belt that would be attached to the rear wheels of the vehicle and that would push the vehicle forward. So somehow Henry Ford knew that the answer to what he was searching for lay in just such a series of explosions from inflammable gas. But what Henry Ford did not know that he was on the threshold of an invention that would be the prototype of the modern internal combustion engine. A dream was beginning to take shape in Henry's mind. If only he could work this out, if only he could create such an engine, then he would be able to make farm locomotives, steam engines and even vehicles that would transport people and all of these would be powered by a small and compact safe engine. Henry Ford was a man driven by a passionate goal. He wanted to invent vehicles that would transport people and things across vast spaces in a manner that would be easy, comfortable and affordable. This dream that possessed him became the driving force of his life and it was unrelenting and it would not let go of Henry Ford until it was accomplished in its totality. It is generally perceived that having a goal and a vision are vital to success in life. In fact, Thomas Carlyle, an English essayist and historian of the Victorian era once said that a man without a goal is like a ship without a rudder. Any wind will carry him somewhere and eventually he will arrive at some port. But will that arrival bring gratification to his soul? Probably not, but knowing what one's goal is and striving to achieve it will definitely bring a sense of satisfaction to one that at least one has tried. Henry Ford's life is a vivid testimony to the importance of having a vision, a goal and a dream to give direction to one's life. This was a passion that was burning in his bones. It preoccupied his thought life and every spare moment of his life was dedicated and devoted to the pursuing of his goal. He found that he could never shrug it off. He could never shake it off because the goal and the vision became the thing that was driving him to the accomplishing of what was to be the purpose of his life and the changing of the world as he had seen it before. In the complete pursuit of his dream and vision, Henry Ford was very fortunate to have the total support of his wife. There came a time in his experimentation when he knew that he must leave the village of Dearborn and move to the city of Detroit because in Detroit he could have more easy access to mechanics and tools and all the things that were needed for the completion of his project. His wife was more than happy to leave her comfort zone on the farm and travel with him to Detroit to see her husband's vision become a reality. Pursuing his dream was not easy for Henry Ford. When he went to Detroit, he began to work in an electrical company where the wages were so low that he had to supplement his income by taking classes at the YMCA and also by repairing watches. However, none of this deterred him. In fact, it was two years before Henry Ford could find either the time or the resources to even begin to work on his dream project. The truth is that dreams don't become a reality without difficulties. In fact, the road to success is often dotted with challenges and obstacles. But success does belong to those who are there for the long haul, for those who are willing to stay, to stick and to persevere 
overcoming every challenge and obstacle along the way in order to get the prize of that dream which they have nurtured in their hearts. At about the same time that Henry Ford was dreaming his dream of creating a vehicle to transport things and people, two brothers, Wilbur and Orwell Wright, also were nurturing a long-held dream. Their dream was to put a flying machine into the sky. In the face of the greatest opposition from elders, from their parents, from people who mocked them, these two brothers just continued steadfastly to nurture that dream and all the technology and resources that they had was to be found in their family-owned bicycle shop. Yet, just because these two brothers decided to hold on to their vision and to believe for the unbelievable, in 1903, these two brothers were able to put the first airplane into flight. And so it was in Detroit, in a shed at the back of his house, that Henry Ford built his first engine to run on explosions of petrol gas, the prototype of the modern day car. It was made of odds and ends, a gas pipe, a hand wheel from an old lathe machine, and it worked with Clara's help. While she poured in the petrol with one hand and regulated its flow into the engine with the other, the engine started up with a deafening roar, shooting flames up from the exhaust and shaking with terrible vibrations. Henry Ford had built his first proper petrol engine that would drive a car and he had done it in seven days. He was elated. The second engine, however, took two years to build as Ford was increasingly busy in his job at the Edison Electric Company. When the engine was made to his satisfaction, bit by bit, Henry assembled the car around the machine. It had four bicycle wheels, an ordinary bicycle saddle worked for a seat, a tiller worked to steer the front wheels. The engine was mounted behind the seat between the rear wheels. Power was transmitted by two belts that ran to the counter shaft, one for low speed, about 10 miles an hour, and one for high speed, reaching to around 20 miles per hour. A lever enabled the driver to choose either. This was the forerunner of the shift gear system. The car had no brakes and it could not move backwards. In order to warn people of its approach, Henry installed a huge alarm gong on the front that was to be used by the driver. And a bicycle light was installed also on the front to provide the required light. In the typical fashion of a genius who was totally focused on the goal that was ahead of him, Henry Ford continued to build his car in the shed without ever giving a thought to how he was going to take the car out because the door of his shed was no way wide enough for the car to get through. But nothing would deter this man on a mission. He got hold of an axe once the car was ready and broke a hole through in the wall of the shed and took the car out onto the streets of Detroit for its first ride. People stopped and stared in amazement at this contraption that went by, belching, spluttering, jolting as it went along the streets of Detroit. Suddenly, in the middle of the road, it came to a halt. Nonplussed, Henry Ford got off the car made a minor repair and continued on his journey, driving the car right back through the big hole in his shed and parking it from where it had started off. And thus it was in 1986 that this historic trip marked the first drive of an automobile in the streets of Detroit. As per the advice of Henry Ford's landlord, who came by at that very moment and was shocked to see his shed all broken, Henry Ford then made swinging doors 
that would enable him to take the car out and bring it in with ease each time that he wanted to drive it. So right along with the invention of the car, we have the invention of the first ever garage doors as well. Thus it was in 1896 that the first ever historic trip of a car made by Henry Ford around the streets of Detroit took place. On June 4th, 1896, in a tiny workshop behind his home on 58 Bagley Avenue, Henry Ford, through holding long and hard onto his dream, turned out his first gasoline-powered motor car. After more than two years of experimentation, Henry Ford, at the age of 32, had completed his first experimental automobile. He dubbed his creation the Quadricycle, so named because it ran on four bicycle tires. The success of the vehicle fueled Ford's automobile ambitions, leading ultimately to the founding of the Ford Motor Company in 1903. I sincerely hope the story of Henry Ford has inspired you today, just as it has inspired me to see how a vision can take a hold of a man and then the vision drives him to its completion. But there are two essential things that are necessary before that can happen. One is to know your core competence. And I really hope some of you have already begun to think today about what your strength is and where your gifting lies, that you may invest in it and develop it to a level of excellence where you can also contribute to this society and this wonderful world that we live in. And secondly, that once you have a dream or a goal or a vision, that dream, if you will give it your all, notwithstanding all the obstacles that may come in your way, you will have a life that is truly fulfilling, one that will bring happiness and joy to you for all the days of your life. And we will look in the next episode at more that we can learn from the life of Henry Ford.